Who was, who was here yesterday? Okay. This one isn't as fun. Uh, I did it. It's not totally WordPress related, but I think it's relevant to everyone using WordPress, and I think it's uh, especially relevant compared to other options for WordPress because it's very, it, it integrates well with the WordPress solution. So this was something I worked out. It's not, it's actual original thinking. It's not just best practices from the community or anything. So it is controversial and you can have a different opinion. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only way. I'm saying here's an interesting idea I hope you'll consider and uh, to ask questions about if you have them. So uh, like yesterday, I'm Jeremy and I've been doing websites a long time. I've been using WordPress since version 1.2. Anyone else been using WordPress since version 1.2? Yeah, yeah, remember when the back end was black and white? Yeah. Uh, so what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about dry CSS, which means don't repeat yourself CSS, and I'll talk all about what that means. But I'm gonna start with an example of my website, which is where I figured out the system. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the principle in general and how it solves inherent problems in CSS. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how, what you do, uh, how it works and why I think it's useful, and then we'll finish it off with a, some discussion of the technical solutions that solve the same kind of problems and how they can integrate with what I'm talking about, dry CSS. So, dry example of voices. This is my website I work on. Uh, I work full time for this nonprofit called Global Voices. We write posts about citizen media, like blogs and Twitter, what people are saying all around the world. And uh, one of our things is that we have lots and lots of translations. So the content is both about all the languages and in all the languages. We have 36 websites with about uh, all those ones, I think a few more now that are uh, active, but it has to support a lot of different languages and that means it had to be uh, fluid. Uh, it, nowadays we call it responsive, uh, but at the time I did this, actually, the responsive wasn't a thing yet. No one had realized that was useful for mobile, so it was still called Fluid, and it was like a flaky thing that was cool in like 2004 and never took off. But this whole website sort of like stretches a lot, and every piece of text had to be ready for a different size, because in Chinese, the word countries is a single character. And in Malagasy, it's like 20 characters long, because in Malagasy, the language of Madagascar, Everything is really long for some reason. It's like the way English and French, you're like, it's a little longer. You're like, Malagasy? Like, what the hell? The Malagasy last names, you need to have, every time I design something with a username, I need to get that Malagasy last name to make sure it fits, because it's not going to. There's a Greek guy at WordCamp that affected the badge design. <laughs> um, anyway, that's separate from this. But the point was, I wanted it to be Fluid, I did a lot of stuff with uh, modern CSS, like all the rounded corners are CSS rounded corners. Uh, so they don't work in some browsers, but they work in the new ones, but they actually require a lot of CSS. Uh, and that was part of why I ended up doing this, because the, those rounded corners pointed out how repetitive my CSS was and how bloated the CSS file ends up being. So what did I do? I dried it out. I stopped repeating myself in my CSS. The effect was that uh, going through it, I went from 4,200 to 2,400 lines of CSS uh, by taking all the shapes, text sizes, colors, and certain modules, like types of things, uh, and standardizing them and then not repeating them. And so it was the exact same design. This was like, I worked on the whole design, it was basically finished, and I spent a day drying it, and I got that difference in the CSS, uh, which applies both to its uh, size if for a download and its simplicity uh, as a design. So uh, how did I do it? Just as the broadest overview, I have groups uh, that define shared properties. So you can see here, small text, and then it has one property, font size 11px. That's a group. The groups have many selectors, so you can see that under small text, I have a bunch of different things that are our small text, and then each property value pair is defined only once. So that should be the only place in my whole style sheet that says font size 11px. Now, uh, just as some examples for visually, uh, these are like the, the groups I used. So for example, rounded five border two is everything you see with that thick rounded border. And then I had ones for colors like medium orange text, light orange text, medium green text, light green text, uh, pale gray background, the pale orange background, et cetera. 
And then the button I used as an example because it has states. So you have the button, the button hover, and the button click are all separate, but I can apply, I can use that group for anything that I want to look like a button. So the previous posts link, if, I, if that's a button, I use that group uh, on it. And um, one of the things to remember is I'm not promoting these labels. It, your design is your design. You decide, like I thought of it as like these sets of colors with shades, because that's how I plan the design. But you could do it however you want. The point is that you, know, you break up your site and then you reuse things over and over and over. So uh, I also use the drive principle for IE hacks uh, and uh, for font size groups. So in IE, uh, I don't know if everyone knows, who knows Zoom 1? So if, if you learn only a single thing today, it's that when you want that problem, when you check something in IE and it has a background, but there's floating things, and so the background doesn't cover the floating things, if you put Zoom 1 on the container, the background will contain the floating things. It does what position relative does, but without doing anything else. It does absolutely nothing except fix that problem. So anyway, learn about Zoom 1. Uh, but instead of putting it over and over and over on everything that needed it, I put it once and put everything that needed it above it with the commas. And uh, I also had, uh, for some languages, you need larger font sizes, like Arabic is really teeny tiny, even at the same pixel size, because it uses the vertical space really differently. Uh, so there was an option to make the big text, and so I used this system to make the big text uh, that was much, which made it more efficient. So backing off from my dry system, good CSS uh, has some features that I think are inherent to it and are inherent to its design. Like it, it was meant to be used this way. Uh, and one of the principles is that style should always be separate from content. That's the whole concept. HTML is the structure of your document. It's what's there. There's lists, there's paragraphs, there's images. Uh, tags uh, are what the HTML is made of, and then the classes and IDs, like class equals and ID equals, which give you the dot in the CSS and the hashtag in the CSS, define what the content, what type of thing it is uh, for each tag. So like you'll have a, a div, which is a division, which just means box, and then class equals, and then whatever the class equals is, should say what kind of box it is. This is a box of headlines, this is a box with a post in it. It should never define how it looks, it should define what it is. So you should say dot post and not dot red. Um, and you should avoid specificity by harnessing the cascade. And what that means is that selectors and definitions should be as global as possible. So you should never define sidebar li if you could have just defined li. What is really so special about that sidebar li that needs a definition? Your li definition should be one, it should apply to the whole site, and only if you really need an exception should you use it. But you should second guess, because why isn't it exactly the same? Isn't your site one big design where lists would all look the same? But, and then you say maybe like headlines li or something like that, certain list items, menu li, uh, but you wanna keep it as general as possible. That way, when you add a list in the sidebar, it just works because the global definition is good. And your life is a lot simpler when you, when you work that way from the start, always keeping it as shallow as possible instead of deep. Instead of when you see a problem, you're like, oh, it's not working, I know, I'll add another ID. Uh, I'll add like hashtag content. Oh, now it works. Now it's a really strong selector that picks up that thing and changes it. Don't do that. Ask yourself why it wasn't working with the simpler selector and go and remove whatever was blocking it. Does that make sense to people? That, so that's, that's, these are two things, if you don't agree with these, if you think these aren't important, especially the first one, then you're gonna think my system is crap. But I think if you, if you take these two things and apply them to your work, it's gonna be a lot simpler and you're gonna make better designs uh, because having them uh, implemented well, it inspires you to do a good job. So what does don't repeat yourself mean? Uh, it is also called the single source of truth principle, and according to Wikipedia, it means every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. So everything should only be there once. Uh, and when your code is dry, or anything is dry, then all the uses of it change together uh, when you change it, rather than you have to recopy it over and over and over again. So in PHP, or in all other programming, uh, don't repeat yourself is what you're implementing when you create a function. Instead of like copying and pasting that code into each 
a template, you make a function once and you call the function. You don't repeat yourself. Uh, it's the same thing, you put a variable at the top and you set it to a value and then you use it over and over in the function. You're not repeating yourself because repeating yourself is bad because you always forget to copy one of the copies and change one of them when you want to change them all. And I like to say that bugs love a wet mess, which is true in reality, and it's true in programming. Uh, if you're not repeating yourself, bugs will breed in that place. Uh, or, or when you are not repeating yourself, there's a lot less places that are gonna slowly creep up on you and you'll realize it'll take you forever to debug it using all of the great advice from Mo yesterday. So, what's the problem? Why can't we just have dry CSS without Jared telling us about it? Well, the problem is that CSS is really, really simple. It's not a programming language. It's barely anything. Uh, there's no variables. So we can't even have something like dark blue equals and then a hex uh, and then say dark blue over and over again. We have to always repeat things. Uh, and there's no functions or what is called mixins in the context of CSS, which means like a set of properties, like a blue background with blue text and, uh, and a blue border. Uh, so we can't, otherwise we would like to do that. That would be nice if we could just say rounded corners and then just say this one has rounded corners and then somewhere else use a function that says, well, rounded corners means all these properties for all the different browsers and vendor prefixes, et cetera. So the result is that since the beginning, we've all just been having constant duplication of style. And the only thing to save us was the avoid specificity by harnessing the cascade. If you ask the designers of CSS, why isn't there variables or mix-ins, uh, like Tim Berners-Lee would tell you, you don't need them. Why are you using all of these complicated selectors? You should have a simple website with no sidebar. Like, it was designed for a world where, without sidebars, where there's just the top of the document, and then you go all the way to the bottom. That's not how it works. Uh, so. Let's take a new way of organizing the CSS without, while accepting these uh, shitty limitations. So the process is two things. Don't repeat yourself. So don't repeat a style property definition, so something like font size 11px, uh, if you can avoid it. You, everything should be there only once, if at all possible. And then group selectors with shared properties. Uh, so that means take all those selectors, and the selectors are the things like uh, dot post li, or dot sidebar li, and stack them up with commas rather than defining each of them on their, on their own. So to create dry CSS, uh, you, like it, say you had some, some, a big CSS file that you were gonna convert. What you do is you take selectors that share properties. So I w found that I had a ton of things that had this background color FFF, which is white, and border color CCC, which is gray. And uh, just each one, take the selector, put it into this big tall stack, add it with the comma and uh, above the thing and then remove it from its own little section where the, for example, dot subscription manager OL had its own section, just remove that. And often you were like, oh wait, all I'm removing it and now it's gone because all it had was that thing that was repeated over and over. Uh, other times there's other styles left there. But either way, the background color is all the same. Uh, the second part is to name them. So you have to come up with a name. And like I said, I don't promote my names as what you should use, but the idea is just have like a, an abstract reference to what those styles represent and come up with a name for it so that you can see it, so that it shows up in the inspector when you look at it to see what the style is. So in this case, I have light white background and medium white background, which is actually confusing, but they're different shades of gray border. Um, and, but in my design, the idea was I had one white background for when it was against white. Like if, if it was white behind it, it has a light gray background, but if it's gray behind it, a darker gray background so that the uh, border, so that the border shows up. Um, and then take that name that you've come up with uh, and use it in the style both at the top uh, as an as a ID. You never use that ID. That ID doesn't go in your HTML anywhere. There's nothing that says ID equals light white background. That's just instead of a code comment because this way it shows up when you view uh, like inspect element in Chrome or Firefox. Uh, it'll say light white background, so you have something right there to look at, because if you put it in a code comment, which you could do right above, it wouldn't show up in the inspector, so it's not a good idea. And then at the bottom, 
uh, separately the same thing as a class with lowercase. Uh, and the uppercase does nothing except make it distinctive. It just makes it look separate, which I find helps. Uh, and you're allowed to do uppercase, even though you should, normally the standard is never do uppercase uh, CSS classes. And, uh, but at the bottom, uh, class, just for two reasons. One is that it's just embarrassingly uh, common that I would, when doing this, make a mistake with that last comma because the last item can't have a comma in, in CSS or the whole thing will break. Everything after that will, will be broken. So what you need to do is always have a comma on the last one. So by having the last thing be this class, I could copy and paste everything else without worrying about the comma, if that makes sense. Um, and also you have that there, you're not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be using this dot lightweight background in your HTML anywhere, but you can. Like say you're in a post and you just want to quickly see what it'll look like, you can add class equals light white background and it'll work uh, without having to say to yourself, oh, well, does dot translation have anything else on it other than that white background? You just, you could use it for testing and stuff like that or emergencies. So organizing dry CSS. Now, when, you, this is totally up to you, but the idea is that you have these groups and then you have group types. So your design is gonna be made up of these different sets of groups uh, and in my, that, that reflect whatever you want. So I wrote uh, your design, operational needs, or other CSS methodologies might make you wanna choose different types of groups. In my case, I did them as shapes, which are uh, amounts of padding and roundedness, uh, text types, which are basically just sizes, colors, uh, which were backgrounds, uh, text that go together. So the, like, the blue text and the blue background are designed to work together in different ways so that the light blue background looks good with the medium blue text on it, uh, and then a light blue text as the hover for links, et cetera. Um, and I think that this is a pretty good one that a lot of websites could apply and just say, okay, what are the shapes, what are the font sizes, and what are the colors? Ex abstract that, you're probably gonna get a lot of benefit to, by drawing out your CSS even in those ways. Although if your site is really like, your design is really organized in a specific way, it might help to uh, use a completely different way and say like, okay, it's just like important things and unimportant things and like whatever you want, it doesn't matter. The point is if you're repeating selectors over and over again, or uh, you're repeating the property style definitions, uh, you should be having groups instead. So uh, this is, this image is just from a program I use called CSS Edit for Mac that tragically doesn't exist anymore, but there's one called Espresso that builds it in, but it also has HTML editing, uh, which is annoying because it's a bit more expensive and stuff. Uh, but it just has this nice property of showing you along the side of the app is the list of all the selectors you have, and it made a great visual of all of the names of the groups that I use. Um, and I totally recommend finding a CSS tool that shows you the list of all the styles. Whether you're using this or not, it's a really great way to uh, look through your style sheet rather than just viewing the source, which is a really messy way. Uh, right. So, uh, keeping it dry, well, what, what, what are we thinking about as we're making these dry groups and deciding what should be a group and what should be left as exceptions? So you just wanna say individual selectors, anything like dot warning, you wanna make it as rare and sparse and use it only when you have to and treat it as an exception. Treat it as like, oh yeah, I guess. Um, the, the question you have to ask yourself is why isn't this part of a group? Like when I have dot error and it's font weight bold, I just need to say to myself, why, why is that dot error and not something more general. Why isn't that part of a more global group? Uh, because I might be wasting my time and there might be something that would be better off changing altogether uh, if there's other things that are bold for the same reason. Um, and also, don't go crazy, right? Like you can go too far and get obsessed like anything and I'm not recommending that. I don't think that is gonna solve problems for you. What you wanna do is take the low hanging fruit, things like rounded corners or especially CSS gradients which have so much CSS that goes into them. Repeating that for each thing is just nuts. Um, and a lot of people are already doing that. A lot of you probably already do this to some degree. It's, I just think if you think about it specifically, it's gonna go a lot further. So for example, with this thing, which was actually like, embarrassingly, this was the p p part of my code that most closely uh, 
modeled my thing about only use them as exceptions. But when I stand up here and I look at it, all I can think is the ways in which it fails. Like dot error and dot warning, wait, those are both like messages, like big important messages I want to show to the user. Why isn't dot warning bold? Like shouldn't they be the same? Like that should be the same thing and one should just be yellow and one should be red. Uh, so I should create a dot message and then put both of them in and then just put each of them into their color, which they already are somewhere you can't see. The dot warning is yellow and the dot error is red. But they should also share that, uh, that type of uh, whatever the margin and the alignment, like those should go together. Um, but it's not always you know, economical with your time to go around tweaking every single thing. But it's good because then when you have another kind of message, like you have a success message, you know exactly where it goes. And in the process, you thought through what your design is that you have this messages concept uh, that you didn't realize because when you created warning and error, they were at different times. You weren't thinking about how you'd need other kinds of messages. So I'll try to go quickly through this benefits because it's really detailed. I gave this talk at Confu, which is a really intense uh, developer conference in Montreal, uh, and it wasn't about WordPress. So. The benefits, the, the main benefits is two simple rules that solve a lot of problems uh, compared to some other CSS methodologies that have a lot of rules and uh, I think are a lot less effective on that complexity to usefulness ratio. Uh, the fact that you end up with less CSS overall means um, smaller style sheets for download in kilobytes uh, as well as shorter for just looking over and trying to understand and if someone else needs to work with it. Um, so, it, and right, the other ones are all here. So conceptual design, I think, like I was saying about the dot messages, using these groups and the group types, which is the thing where it's like the colors and the textiles, uh, it makes you think of your website not as a website, but as a design, as a, as a set of colors and shapes and ways to make things look that you want to reuse over and over again. Uh, and that's important because that's what makes a good design is consistency and like interrelatedness. And when you style each little thing on its own separately and just add more and more CSS, not only is your CSS inefficient and buggy and hard to fix later, but each part of your site is different. The sidebar has this special kind of list and the footer has a special kind of list. Like why are you doing that? It, people don't notice it, but they feel it when your design is consistent all the way through. And doing this will force you to be like, oh yeah, why is there 10 pixels of padding on the list in the footer but not in the sidebar? Like, they can totally be the same and all of a sudden your site is just like one beautiful thing. Uh, I think naming the groups, that process of choosing the, the ID at the top, uh, the same as in PHP, naming your function helps you define what that function is. Often when you name it, you realize it isn't what you thought and then you change the name and then you fix the function to be more clear and more useful because the generalization of it uh, increases the rationality of, of what it is. And finally, listing all group members. So when you have the big stack, listing them uh, all together lets you see which ones are related. So I could see in that top one that dot translation and dot WP caption are both there. And that makes sense because this is just a lot of these are things that go inside of a post that I want to look special, right? And so looking at that list all together uh, encourages optimization that wouldn't otherwise happen. Like you realize uh, that you can remove some of them. Like you, some of them will be like, oh, this is targeting the exact same thing. It's just that one has an extra level of depth. Uh, and you're like, oh wow, I can just remove that, that deeper one and it'll still work. Whereas before, not only were you repeating the styles, you were repeating them completely for no reason at all. Uh, whereas if they're all in different parts, like one is in the part of your CSS that's for the header and one was in the part that's for the body and one was the footer and they're just so far apart that you never would have noticed that they were entirely redundant. So edits to groups affect all members. This is the inherent uh, basis of the whole dry principle that you, when you change one, you don't need to say, what are all the other ones that were sort of using that same thing? Like when you take something that was green and make it not green, you say, okay, wait, what else was green? I need to change all of it to, to orange because probably if I'm changing this one, I need to change the rest. Um, and that means that when you do make changes, you're less likely to miss things in that process. Um, one interesting thing is that when you test something, when you change the shade of green, 
Not only does that one thing change the shade and you go and you reload the page and you're like, hmm, the green is a little darker. You're not just looking at that one thing. Anything else on the page that, that's green changes in sync. So you're like, oh yeah, this one looks a little better, but that other one looks worse now. And if they're both gonna be green, they need to be the same shade, so I'll find a balance that looks good in both places. Uh, and moving selectors between groups, so if you have something that's in the green, like pale green group, and you wanna move it to the pale blue group to see how it is, you just copy the selector and paste it into the other place. It's really, really fast and easy to jump things around between groups compared to changing the styles and using Command Z like a, like a maniac and hoping it remembers uh, and that you can use Command Shift Z to get back to where you were if you don't like the change. Uh, with this, you just copy and paste lines really fast, really easy, works in any editor you can imagine. So it uh, takes advantage of expectors. This is one of the biggest things uh, for me, and this is why I started doing it. If, if the inspectors didn't exist, and this is like when you say inspect element, the old firebug, uh, if they didn't exist, I would never recommend the system because it, it pushes you to take your designs and get away from the old model, which was your CSS file is like your website. It starts at the top and goes all the way to the bottom, uh, and everything is grouped by the parts of the page that are grouped. So everything about header is in a section. Everything about footer is in a section, and everything about post is in a section. Instead, it's here are the styles of my design, and then after that, any very specific uh, stuff related to different parts of the site. Which makes sense if you're like looking at the site, you're like, oh, where, why is the header that way? You go to the header section and you look at all the CSS and try and figure it out before we had inspectors. Who was using CSS before we had inspectors? Okay, you remember, it was hell. Those inspectors, that's like psychic powers compared to what we had before. Or the ability to ask a question and get an answer instead of just stare at someone and try and guess what they're thinking. Um, but anyway. Uh, so when you inspect an object that is you done using dry CSS, what you see is the different groups they participate in. Uh, so you see, oh, I, I right clicked on something, I forget what it was for the screenshot, but I can see that it's in the rounded three border two group, and I can see which ones apply to it, uh, or, and it's also in pale blue background. So you can see what's affecting it, and so uh, I find that really useful for knowing for having the label in the inspector where you could see it and knowing what part of your design it reflects. Um, when you look at it and you see all the other things that are affected, so I can see that features, cycle pager, active slide, like featured headlines, all those things are related. So if I consider changing so something about whatever I was inspecting, I could see that it's gonna affect all those other things and I could sit, consider what effect that will have on the whole design. Um, and then one great thing, similar to what I said before, when I change something, so you know, you go in the inspector and you change the shade of blue and try something else, uh, everything on the website that's that shade of blue changes live. So if I take the text size, uh, 11px, and say, what if it was 12, how would it look? And I press up, everything that will change changes together so I can see how the whole site is affected rather than changing one thing without realizing that, oh, but then the header won't look good because it's using the same styles. Uh, which obviously also you could say, oh, well maybe I'll move the header into something else, but uh, having those live edits change everything is amazing. Like choosing a shade of gray for your overall website is really nice when all the gray stuff simultaneously gets lighter and darker as you change it in the inspector. So uh, one of the benefits, and this one is the biggest thing for WordPress, is that it doesn't require changes to HTML. Now I haven't proposed anything that did, but other people have. Uh, and that's called object-oriented CSS. It's the most popular one, and it's a talk that Stubbornella gave, and lots of people love it, but I don't think a lot of people actually use it effectively, or at least I haven't met them. So uh, the benefit of dry CSS, my thing, is that it uses whatever IDs and classes are already present. Like, there's no reason why you would be adding anything in the HTML. Um, if the HTML needs editing, it's the same old game with HTML, where if there's not enough semantic classes, then it's hard to style and you're annoyed. Uh, so if you're adding stuff, it's just like add more good semantic classes, like dot headlines and dot recent headlines, uh, but never things like dot big headlines. Um, uh, so in WordPress land, we don't control a lot of the HTML we have. Your theme, you could control some of that, and maybe you feel like editing your HTML all the time while you're doing CSS. Uh, but when it comes to WordPress core generating things, when it comes to plugins generating HTML, often all you have is whatever HTML they gave you and whatever classes they gave you and you have to do all the styling. Uh, 
And in that case, you need something that works outside of it. And dry CSS works completely well with that. Compared to object-oriented CSS, which I, I used to have a longer section about it, debating it, but I don't bother anymore. But it recommends the very similar thing to what I'm doing, but instead of having a huge stack of selectors, it tells you make one called dot pale red and then add it in the HTML. Go into the HTML and say div class equals pale red, which is a violation of the principles of CSS as well as a really annoying thing to tell someone in WordPress who's like, but I want to add it to a plugin. How the hell am I going to do that? That's not going to work. Right. So you could check out object-oriented CSS if you want, but uh, I, I think there's better ways. So the completely standard CSS, this I mentioned already, and I'm a nerd about it. I've been a nerd about it since uh, 2003 when I had my XHTML t-shirt. So uh, it's just normal CSS and a way to organize it. It's just something we didn't think of at the beginning. I think this would be much more common as a best practice, but before inspectors, it was a terrible idea. So it's, we all got used to what we do, and now everyone is using less than SAS instead of figuring out how to use normal CSS now that we have inspectors. Uh, so it adheres to the separation of style and content, which is one of those important two things. Uh, it's backwards and forwards compatible because it's just normal CSS. C like it has nothing to do with recentness of CSS. So if you're trying to fix IE with like ancient CSS, or you're trying to use the newest, latest, greatest CSS3 properties, it all works because it's any properties you have are gonna be better off if they're dry. Uh, the CSS you create can be pasted anywhere. So you could take those groups and paste them into something else. Uh, like your child theme, you just, you're on 2012. I go, when I have a 20, 2010 site that I want to make look like Global Voices, I just go to the, to the Global Voices CSS file, grab whatever groups, all the colors and shapes, paste them into the CSS, like custom CSS on 2010, and then start adding whatever parts of 2010 I want to look like that. And in 10 minutes, I have it all with the like pale gray boxes with the rounded two pixel corners. Like it's, it kind of, it's kind of amazing. And there's nothing, nothing about it that will not work. Anywhere where you can put CSS, you can put this. Unlike uh, object-oriented CSS where you can't add dot red into 2010, and unlike uh, other things, certain other technical solutions like Lesson SAS that I'll talk about that don't work in every context. So uh, it, it integrates with other methodologies. So I point out that object-oriented CSS has a lot of other properties that are the good part about it that don't have to do with putting classes into your HTML that are not semantic. So you can check it out for that. There's a better one called SMAX, which is uh, scalable modular architecture for CSS. And that's this link here. And there's a couple of people who have read it, I think, in the room and, and recommend it. Uh, and I read through it because I wanted to see if it was something similar. And it's similar, but very different, and a very interesting approach to how to like organize, like I look at it as a way of organizing your groups and your group types into parts of your site, like types of objects that, are, that you're gonna use over and over that he calls modules. And, it, and in my case, you would use the dry CSS to define those modules, whereas he is a little not pr particularly promoting that. What he's promoting is the groups, so you could repeat, doesn't mind if you repeat the CSS. But either way, whatever you're doing, uh, it's gonna be more efficient cleaner and more conceptually strong if you do it with dry CSS. So one thing I was like, okay, I wanted to make sure, it's just weird to see a stack of 20 selectors all on top of each other, right? Like you're like, wait, isn't there something wrong with that? Is that, is that bad? Like that's a lot of things. Uh, but it turns out like, no, not really. Like CSS is really efficient. The browsers are really good at rendering CSS. And there's nothing about that stack that's any worse than if they were all just defined separately and it's a smaller file. So this guy, Steve Saunders, did a bunch of research, Not, nothing to do with me, but it completely was relevant to what I'm talking about. And he said, for most websites, the performance gains from optimizing CS selectors, CSS selectors will be small and are not worth the costs. Uh, and specifically that, like he did things where he'd say like, like a thousand selectors and see if it made a difference. And it didn't make a difference. Like if it's not important, it's only if they're used. If you have a giant web page with tons of object, uh, like HTML in it, then yeah, it's gonna be slow to apply the CSS because there's a ton of objects. But if it's a small site with only a few things, the amount of CSS really doesn't have a big effect. And uh, on the second link, uh, and all my slides are on uh, my website and on slideshare.com slash Jeremy Clark. Um, the second link has stuff he found that does have a big effect and that just has nothing to do with the amount of selectors. Like the order, if you have something like uh, P, like content P, 
uh, and like the order of things. Like it goes right to left instead of left to right. So if you care about it, if you really care about browser CSS rendering performance, there's stuff you can do that will make a big difference and has nothing to do with the number of selectors. Um, another one is hover. Anytime you have like the switching back and forth from hover is a lot of work for the browser. So things like whenever you hover over the content, all the links change color, like don't do that. That's terrible for performance. Just for example, things that do affect it that have nothing to do with what I'm talking about. So, why hasn't someone invented variables and functions for CSS? That's the question. Uh, why do we have to use this weird system that Jared thinks is good? Uh, can't we write a program for it? And the answer is yes, you can write a program for it. Two different projects exist that are popular and mature and uh, work. And one is called Less and one is called SAS, and they're very similar except for certain details. So what they do is they add a new language based on CSS. So they both look like CSS. SAS had two versions and one didn't look like CSS, but they have a new one that looks more like CSS. But either way, it's the same selectors and everything. They just add extra stuff and then add a parsing layer that handles it. So you write a thing that sort of CSS, but with extra stuff on top, SAS takes it in and then spits out uh, a normal CSS file that was based on your thing. Sort of the way WordPress takes a template file, processes it, and spits out actual HTML. So the main things they add are variables. So you can see a, an example of a variable up in the corner. We said add color. It's actually a, a bad example. The, it should say something like at red, and then define a particular red, and then say the header, the color is red. Uh, but the point is that you can reuse it over and over again, right? So that's dry in the less. Uh, that is, in fact, dry. Like, you're only putting the actual hex code for the color once. And the other one is mixins uh, or inheritance, which works like this, where you say dot rounded corners, right? Every class you have, you can just put it somewhere else. So in header, they just put dot rounded corners, and then any properties that are in rounded corners are automatically included in header. And what that does is when what the browser ends up seeing is header with all this stuff and footer with all this stuff. And then they go even further, and you can get all programmy if you know PHP and you love to like uh, programmatically determine things. They give you options like here there's a, a default argument of five. So by default, the rounded corners will be border radius five, but then here they're saying, so this one would be five, but then dot rounded corners 10 px. That means that it's gonna be 10. So then you don't even have to create, like in my example, you have to create rounded five and rounded 10 to get those two options, whereas here one thing does both. Uh, but it will put the, that whole code will be rendered twice. What, what the browser sees will have all of it over and over again. Um, and what the difference is with, not with less, but with SAS, there's an option where you use inheritance, which is similar but slightly different. And what it does is, instead of adding it into each one, it adds them in a, with a comma and it, and it repeats them over and over again. So the effect is that it's, a, it's more dry. The actual end result is dry, not just the pre-parsed uh, script. So it's very tempting when you want to program your CSS. Another solution here is to do the programming in PHP and then just have PHP write out CSS. The answer is that that's not good because your CSS should never be inside your page. We all do it. WordPress themes do it when there's an option. They often, Kubrick had a ton of CSS that was rendered by HTML in the header for a long time. It's bad for perform, it, that's not bad for performance. It's just conceptually bad. What's bad for performance is that every page has that CSS in the page which adds kilobytes. Whereas if you have it in a separate file, the browser downloads it once and then every subsequent page view it doesn't have to repeat it. It just keeps that file in its memory. It doesn't re-download it. So every piece of CSS you can put in that external file so it's cached is going to be more efficient. Um, OK, so I'll continue. And uh, so yeah, they actually have more things. There's switch conditions. Like uh, Depending on how deep you want to go, you can get pretty serious with your CSS. Although I would argue if you're going to use these things, you want to keep it a little bit to these things where it's simpler to back out if you decide you don't want to use them anymore. So what, are we th what, what do we need to think about with these? Because they sound really good. Um, if you're an expert programmer, then you can do a lot with it. And maybe that's the difference. If you're really going to use all the tools, then that's an argument that you should invest in these because uh, you're going to get the most out of them. Um, if you have an external framework, 
then this works really great with them, like and, and Blueprint and Grids and all these different ones that give you a preset set of styles. Then you can have your style sheet separate and just add things in. Uh, and then if they update, uh, you can just update the, the, the parent document and leave your like lesser SAS document completely uh, isolated from that so that it just starts inheriting the new ones instead. So what's the problem? Well, you're not using standard CSS, and you've become addicted to this uh, piece of software that isn't a standard web uh, practice. So maybe it'll be OK, maybe it won't. Maybe you can, you can always just render your CSS and say, give me that output. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to walk away, and I'll just deal with the fact that it's not dry. But do you want to have to live with that possibility if you could just use standard CSS uh, and no other software and not have to run a special app and not have to worry if your editor has support for it. Uh, and one of the biggest things, they, you can still use them to create really shitty, wet, sloppy style sheets that are full of extra garbage. Like the end result is often still extra garbage. And in fact, uh, some of the most outrageous offenses to the idea of dry CSS are created by these things because they, they tempt you to just, oh yeah, I just inherit it, inherit it, inherit it, and you don't pay attention, and all of a sudden people are like, it crashes the browser and we don't know why, and it's like, oh, because there's like a thousand, like they have features that just generate hundreds and hundreds of uh, different definitions that make no sense. So you still have to plan your design if you want it to be coherent, uh, and it will encourage that conceptual design that I think is a benefit of dry CSS, uh, but if you want to have really effective CSS, you're still gonna have to think about it specifically. So how do we get around some of those problems if you do want to use precursors? Um, one is to use it for development only and to publish natural CSS with themes. Like That's just a no-brainer. Almost everyone does that. There's ways to do it live on your server where it parses from the less, but that's a really weird idea. Um, ideally, when you commit it, you commit the final CSS, like the thing that's going to go on your CDN and stuff uh, is not less. So you can create CSS that is still elegant once it's uh, put out, and it, it's totally possible. You just have to think ahead. And the main thing is to use inheritance rather than mix-ins, which is the thing where, so the mix-ins work by saying, uh, here's the, the mix-in is table base, and then it in, at include, wait. Anyway, I forget exactly what this image means. But this is the two kinds of things with SAS. And the one, the one generates the, uh, the property over and over and over again, and the other one stacks them on top of each other so that you only have it actually stated once. And the other option uh, that I realized uh, after I gave this talk twice is to use dry CSS with less, so you have the less d definition once, so that when you have the, this thing, right, you have your rounded corners, like all you need to do to make this dry, uh, assuming that they were both the same number of pixels, like if they were both 10px, is to have header, comma, footer, dot rounded corners. And then you would only have it repeated once uh, rather than over and over and over again. And your ending CSS would ultimately be dry CSS and you could start working from there if you ever want to quit using less. So if you want to use these preparsers, the kind of way they work is either you have an editor that has it built in and that exists in some cases, or you uh, use a, a pro program like CodeKit that runs in the background and you tell it, like in this case, I've sort of told it about 2010 and said, hey, watch 2010. There's a style.less file and I, whenever I change it, I want you to resave a style.css so, so that when WordPress checks it, it sees the CSS instead of the less. Um, and this program is kind of interesting and weird, and it does a bunch of stuff. Like when you save the CSS file, it'll automatically reload your browser, I think, uh, so that it, it you know, it, it's an interesting tool that does a lot of stuff. But it, it's that's the main way on OS X. And then I'm not sure what you would do on Windows and Linux, but I'm sure there's similar solutions that do stuff. Um, you can also use less in a JavaScript format that does it in the browser. But anyway, those are some tools. So just to review. Uh, what I'm proposing here is just that instead of defining these colors over and over again, you identify what it is that you have that's part of your design that you want to keep, you put it together, 
and add names uh, that make sense with the two versions, and you come up with your whole list of things that defines your website, and then you start adding selectors as necessary uh, with as shallow as possible, so preferably, you know, H3 only, but maybe a roundup H3 if you really need to. Uh, and then you just enjoy your newly clean design that is holistic and consistent and smaller weight CSS. Thank you.